for a very, very he is now an, a research scientist at Google. You are still at Google, right? Yes. <laughs> um, so he has done a lot of amazing work on differential privacy, um, ranging from the theory and the practice. So he's going to talk about uh, one of his works today. Thank you, Lynn. Uh, so yeah, we can talk about the talk if you like it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so this talk is going to be about uh, federated learning with formal user level differential privacy guarantees. So, this is the outcome of like a two year work stream at Google, spanning across multiple colleagues of mine. And uh, yeah, and there's a summarization of that work. Each of the terms here, with either parenthesized or italicized, will have meaning. Mm -hmm. And I will go into details of why I have like highlighted that. I am from the Google Research Brain team. And as I told, it represents really the work of many people. And I will at least give an acknowledgement just to make sure that everyone is well acknowledged. It's a large group of people. Okay. So to set the stage, uh, and uh, I'm not sure the background of the audience to kind of uh, bring everyone to the same stage. So what are you really trying to do? You have a bunch of data points. And there is some trusted learning algorithm sitting behind the trust boundary. And uh, it is producing outputs. And there is an adaptive communication either with an analyst or a user or an adversary. And you want to make sure that the, whatever you are giving out, the transcript of the communication preserves privacy in the context of differential privacy. And I will, like, for completeness purposes, I will give one slide of differential privacy. So the question, the high, very high level question is like, what practical algorithms can we afford while preserving differential privacy? Reporting in progress. So, so oh. practicality, is a, uh, practicality is a major component of this uh, whole question. Okay. This is a prototypical picture for non-convex learning. So you are looking at non-convex learning problems. We are looking to minimize the test error or the prediction error. Although this talk is not going to be a theory talk, otherwise I would have delved into like, why are you looking at this error? But at this point, uh, you are minimizing the test error, which can be written in this equation. And this is almost like no-brainer that this is what non convex looks like. Just an example of like a laundry list of different types of problems where this shows up: cognate RNNs, not any list squares. Uh, in this talk, I will be focusing on RNNs specifically, but whatever I'm saying would be valid for other ones also. And the reason I listed the other two also is that like we have diff good differentially private algorithms for the other two cases. So what is differential privacy? This was uh, proposed in 2006 by a couple of papers, Dwarf Machine and Simon Smith and Dwarf Kentapati, Machine, Mironov and Nesim in 2006. It essentially says that an adversary learns almost the same thing about an individual user, independent of presence or absence in the data set. Uh, the closeness is measured by these two parameters, epsilon and delta. These are privacy knobs. Epsilon, you should think to be a small constant. Delta is something like one over poly in the data set size. Uh, one important thing is that uh, we are protecting user level privacy, meaning that when I say protect the privacy of an individual, it really mean a user, not a single interaction of the user. That I, I should be able to hide the presence or absence of, the, of an user and their complete interaction in the system. Okay. So that's the setup on which you're operating. Uh, on a systemic front, we are looking at cross device FL. So you have a bunch of devices, uh, although these are not smartphones, but still. Uh, so the pictures I got, so you can think that it's one of devices. Uh, yeah, so these devices, uh, the way it works is like uh, these devices do local training and then they talk to the server on the cloud and they get a model update and this process goes on. <laughs> Finally, after this uh, process ends, the model is deployed onto the devices. Now, for the purposes, federated learning has different trust assumptions, but specifically for the purpose of this talk, the trust boundary is outside the model deployment. So the adversary only sees the model deployment. So that's the, uh, that's the setup in which you're operating on. So you can go to like a more nuanced version where the trust boundary lies on the device. You can go to SECAG, SECAG and different variants of, uh, uh, or distributed differential privacy, different variants of it. These are like active work streams we, are, uh, we have been thinking of. But uh, for this talk, I will just look at uh, no. so, so this is the same as the central model because Google is 
this is pretty much the, the world for my topic should think to be the central model. Okay. Yeah. And the challenge, the reason why federated learning comes in the picture is uh, because of some of the design challenges that come in, not because of uh, fundamental research problems. Yeah. Right. So, so this is the punchline of the talk. Even if you forget the rest of the talk, doesn't matter. Uh, this is the uh, most, I mean, most important publicity. And uh, this is the. Uh, we are, I'm going to talk about a deployed next word prediction model for European Spanish for Gboard. If anyone is in that keyboard, then it is running this algorithm with epsilon of 8.9 and delta 10 to the power of minus 10 user level differential privacy, which is equivalent to 0.81 ZCDP. Why is this uh, why is this claim important? This is the first known, at least to my knowledge, first known deployed instance of differential privacy where one is claiming a formal guarantee. We are saying that this is the this is the privacy guarantee we are claiming, and this is what we are willing to defend it. So we have a blog post out of there, and the most of the privacy code is public. So yeah, this is refutable slash verifiable. What is Gbar? Huh? Gbar. What is Gbar? I haven't used it. Gbar. I think it's a type. Keyboard. It's a keyboard. It's a keyboard for. I mean, if you're, if you're Android. Yeah. ZCDP. Yeah, ZCDP is zero concentrated differential privacy. Uh, it is slightly tighter than epsilon delta. So delta allows you catastrophic failure, like with one minus, with delta probability, I can output your data. Uh -huh. But uh, CDP, concentrated differential privacy, does not allow you that. It's uh, it's a more nuanced version of DP. Uh -huh. If I could ask a few random questions, how, how, so how much is e to the power 8.9, just to get a sense? Oh, so this number, you don't treat it as the power of 8.9, actually. Oh, so the 8.9, this is what 8.9 is the hardest. That's why you get the ZCDB number. I see. And why does the ZCDB number look so good? Yeah, so the ZCDB number looks so good because uh, the way you treat it is like you look at the privacy and variable and uh, uh, you look at the diver any divergence of that. Okay. Yeah, so this number, and, and just to put the context, I did not uh, uh, describe the semantics, but typically ZCDB less than one is good. And another uh, benchmark for good or bad reason is that US census, if you look at it, their ZCDP is like 2.6. Although it's a different task, maybe harder, maybe easier, but it's a different task, but it's like significant. Yeah, yeah. So rainy differential privacy says that you have uh, at an order alpha, you get some uh, RDP guarantee and ZCDP is a single parameter, but it says that if my ZCDP is low, then my rainy differential privacy is alpha times low. So it's the linear scaling of the orders. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so the point of putting the CCTV number is that you should not include this 8.9 interpretation as like to the right one. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So now uh, just to start the talk with some background on DPAGD, and then I will go to the main algorithm in the talk, what is called differentially private follower the regularized leader, DPFTRL. Then in the third section, I will talk about the production deployment on Gboard. Uh, I will only give the information as much I can give it publicly. And then uh, some benchmark evaluation, and some benchmark evaluation. Okay, so DPAGD and its close cousin. So DPAGD uh, is uh, the most naive version of differential privacy, what you can think of if you take an AGD algorithm. And this algorithm has been uh, developed over, like I would say, three papers. Uh, so a song at all, then a paper of mine with Rai Basili and Adam Smith, and a body at all in 2015. So the idea is that you have a data set, you take a mini batch size, mini batch of size k, sample uniformly at random, and then you do the following operation: clip the gradient of each of the samples just to bound the influence of the sample, average it add some Gaussian noise and make a state update. If the Gaussian noise was not there, then this is LGD. Right? And you do the process. So one thing to remember is that the scale of the Gaussian noise, L is the clipping parameter, the scale at which you're in bounding. And uh, uh, sigma is what I will call the noise multiplier. So it is the scaling of the sensitivity. So sensitivity is the amount of weight one data sample can change the gradient. And sigma squared is the scaling of the sensitivity. So that's what we will call the noise multiplier through the top. And notice that this is a scale invariant quantity. It it only um, privacy only depends on this object. 
So another thing you notice is that when I'm adding the noise, since I'm averaging k objects, so my noise is at the scale of one over k. The sensitivity of the one over scale at the scale. Uh, the k square out there is it due to the privacy of diffusion by itself? Uh, no, no, there is nothing. There is no sampling here. This is the variance. So the typically, one. typically, uh, normal distributions are written in terms of variance. So the standard deviation is L over K times sigma. So okay. that's the thing. That one sample changes one over K, so your standard deviation is one order of one over K. So I have not introduced any sampling right now. Uh, it will come, but in a bit. Okay. This is the next slide where sampling comes in. So uh, this privacy amplification by sampling, this was proposed by uh, Kashi Vishpanathan and others. And I remember the paper by the name Cleaners. So it's a Cleaners paper. Yeah, so it says that for the same level of privacy, one can add noise as if the gradients were computed over a complete data set as opposed to a mini batch. What I mean by that, if you go, if you think of the previous slide, I was adding noise in the order of one over k, right, to protect their privacy. Now it says that even if I'm averaging over uh, k things, I can add noise in the order of one over n, just because I have sampled this batch at random. So this is the amplification by sample. Obviously, if I add lesser noise, my accuracy would improve. This picture essentially shows that this actually is true even in practice. If you take CIFAR 10 with 100 epochs and 500 to be batch size, uh, if I don't account for privacy duty amplification, this is my privacy utility trade-off is epsilon, whereas if I take by uh, amplification, the pri uh, privacy utility just shoots up significantly. So amplification is a super critical tool for getting a high accuracy DPAGD when you're operating with small batch sizes. So what is privacy amplification? Yeah, so privacy amplification says that, uh, so were, let's, let's go slowly. In the previous slide, we saw that uh, your noise you're adding in the order of one over K to a batch of size K, right? Because if I change one data sample, my, uh, my answer can change by one over K, right? Or L over K. So that's a typical way of doing it. Now I'm saying that since you're sampling this batch of size K uniformly at random from the whole data set of size N, instead of adding noise in the order of one over K, you can add noise in the order of one over N. And this is because uh, since I'm sampling it, if I change one of the data samples, you do not know the mini batch which you picked up did consist that data sample or not. So this uncertainty gives you a privacy amplification. I, I have a question about the why do you want to only use a mini batch? Because you are in a central model, you can see everything. So why not use everything? Yeah, so the problem, uh, so two reasons. Doing full batch is the setup, that's the part federated comes with the picture in a bit. Other, Even otherwise, doing full batch is extremely expensive in this kind of problems. Like, uh, it's because of cost. Because of computation. So how long is it running on the server side or client side? This thing's, uh, uh, as of now, what I said is a server side running, but in the federated setting, it will run on the devices. Oh, I, 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 <laughs> and uh, just to put the things in context, like for the scale of problems we are talking about, even running server side uh, training, large batches are fairly painful to run. So, okay, now comes to the federated algorithm. So, this is a cousin of DPACD. It is called federated averaging, and this will be the baseline algorithm we'll start with. Is that what you do? Uh, uh, you essentially have devices, each device has the data. You sample uh, uniformly randomly sample a set of devices. This is the algorithm, and I will say what are the challenges in this algorithm. Random sampler devices do exactly the same thing and process it. Right? Obviously, it does not make sense how to sample the, I mean, what it means to sample the devices because devices come and go, right? So one way to do it is like Poisson sampling, meaning that every device decides whether it would participate or not. And that also is dependent on like, I mean, for this thing to work in practice, like the device has to be charging, device has to be, uh, I mean, at some particular time in the night, you don't want to, I mean, for your training, you don't want to disrupt the user experience. So there are a bunch of things, but if, once those conditions are satisfied, the devices can decide to sample themselves and be part of this. And whatever I have said, you can pretend uniform sampling and Poisson sampling are interchangeable. Whatever I'm saying for uniform sampling, the thing would also hold for Poisson sampling. And this goes to Elan's uh, point that um, the reason I cannot run full batch in this kind of setting, I don't even have the batch. The data is distributed, right? Devices come and go. Whenever the device shows up, I have to process that data. 
So I don't, I don't have that data. I mean, the trust region boundary says that everything is behind a trust boundary, but the actual the, the implementation in the federated setting is not that. So is, is it like it's computed on the client side or the computed on the server side? I'm still a little bit. The gradients are computed on the client side. The client side. Yeah, the client side gradients are computed. Okay. The, the, the noise addition is done on the server side. Okay. All right. So, like, device, like, Using for some families, they can decide if they don't want to participate. Like, but what if uh, everyone decided to don't want to want to participate? So That's true, but like remember that device is running a code, right? So you, I mean, device is like if the decision of the device is run by algorithmically. Like if A, B, C, D are satisfied, then the device can decide okay whether I will participate or not. It's not like of course I may not want to participate. I can turn off my phone, but there are very I mean. Google is done now. This is how this is how it typically works. So now, and this is the this is the algorithm you would start with, but this has some challenges. So here is the thing. Key requirement uh, is that you have to be uh, the for the privacy guarantee. This has to be sampled, either Poisson sampling or uniform sampling. And this sampling has to be of very high quality because you're using it for privacy guarantee. And this is the next point, is that it is practically infeasible for FL training for the reasons I will tell right now. Yeah. First is that limited client over, overlap. If you look at the distribution of the connected devices, the, during the day and the, during the night, it changes completely. And first of all, uh, the devices which are participating, which are waiting, they, these are also varying. Like, and they vary at a very different rate. Right? Now, and all of this communication is client initiated. So there's none of this communication, like server initiated, like server tells the client to give me this. These are all client, that's how the protocol is set up. Uh, as a result, it's very difficult to know what is the active population size, because for amplification, you need to know like what is the probability I'm sampling, with, like, how, what, is the, what, what is the scale at which I'm operating. It is uh, very hard to know the after population size, and it can vary like orders of magnitude. Right? Furthermore, in all of this like distributed system design, there is things called uh, pace steering. You don't want to overload servers, so you want to kind of uh, you want to steer the pay, I mean steer the load, right? And these are like I mean these this things were designed independent of DP earlier. Suddenly, with while well, designing with DP, I cannot say like. So all your previous design, you have to do from scratch. That doesn't work. So these things are incompatible with a pastry. I guess I'm, maybe I'm missing something. It's like, you know, some people with probability, you can't go estimate how many people there are based on. But how will you probably. choose the probability? Oh, uh, why don't you just choose something and see? No, the point is like, ultimately you need, I mean, if my probability is really low, then I don't get any signal. If my probability is very high, then I don't get amplification. And what I'm saying is the population size is, very so much that having a good probability uh, to choose is a non-trivial task. What about doing like some binary search? You can start with something and then double if it's not. How do you do that? I mean, because like you, you're not, you notice that you're not dealing with a, you, you're not dealing with a uh, database, right? You're dealing with a dynamic participant. Like next time you double, this person must, might not even there. <laughs> so the, the thumb rule is like, if you get someone, don't let that thing go without, <laughs> without doing something. That's the thumb will you will operate. Uh, but it stalls the training. So it stalls the training. Like these trainings are expensive process. I'll tell you how long it takes to train. These are expensive processes. So every time you do this kind of search procedure, you're stalling the training. So there is a feasible protocol which we designed on similar things which are uh, which uh, Eleni were telling. Uh, we had a paper also in ICML or NeurIPS, I think NeurIPS. <laughs> yeah, uh, it requires significant complex changes to the production infrastructure, and as I told you, the amplification depends largely on the available devices, and that can uh, that can vary significantly. So the question arises. So all these problems are starting with amplification. The question is arises for this task. Is this amplification even necessary? Um, yeah. Is that paper the random check-in? Yeah. Exactly. Is this even necessary? Right. Uh, so the question is like, you know, why don't I use uh, is uh, 
privacy amplification is giving me the most pain. So let's cut out privacy amplification. That's the most natural thing to do. Uh, if you look at the, this is uh, again, the thing which I showed is C part 10 that was centralized training. This is federated averages training uh, on a stack overflow. And if you see there is a huge gap in test accuracy between whether it is without amplification versus with amplification. The numbers are close by, but here even a 0.1 difference makes a lot of difference. So the task is different. It's a network prediction task. 0.1 uh, in the test accuracy is an important difference. Yes. So this parameter epsilon, the higher the epsilon, the lower the privacy. Lower the privacy. Okay. So here the test accuracy is it like from 10% to 25% or like what's the unit? Yeah, so it's just no, uh, it is, uh, yeah, so I'm not exactly sure what are the test accuracy percentages. Uh, I believe it is the, 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 it is the false positive rate or something like that for the next word prediction task. But, the, uh, but what I've, what I've been told for this, this is a standard tasks, but I've been told that if for this task, even a 0.1 difference is a major deal because it's a it's a hard task for prediction. Okay. Like you have to predict the next what the person is going to type. And that is in general a hard task. And this is a scale at which you're operating. And the model which you're operating with is not a very complicated model because it has to run in a federated environment. So when, when you say unstack overflow, what does that mean? Oh, unstack overflow is a standard benchmark data set for next word prediction. And this is the results we are showing you for stack overflow. This is just some benchmark. This is some benchmark. It's not this website. There's also a website called Stack Overflow. Oh, it, it is. It is the data set it's from the, that. It's that from that website. Yeah. Okay. I, yeah. I, and this is typically considered to be a standard benchmark for this kind of network prediction tasks. Yeah. So <coughs> the question is, can we avoid sampling altogether and achieve similar privacy related data? Okay. And why were we doing all these things? Uh, this I think I should have told earlier is that in in this FL world in particular, I mean, in, even in the centralized world, amplification is painful. And in the FL world, it is sometimes infeasible to do it. And if I want to give up, now comes the formal utility gar privacy guarantee. We want an algorithm where I can give a privacy guarantee and which is defendable, which I can defend it. And if I don't implement amplification properly, then I cannot defend the number. So I want an algorithm which where I can defend. And that brings to a, the next part of the talk, which is DPFTRL. This is the differentially private variant of follow the regularized leader. And this, in particular, this algorithm would be a streaming algorithm. It would not care about amplification and achieve like similar privacy, utility, what DPFTRL is. Okay. So DP follow the so let's start with uh, basics. Uh, let's look at AGD. If I have AGD, if I deconstruct the recursion of AGD, essentially what I'm getting is that every model update, and this is unprojected, every model update is a prefix sum of the gradients what I have seen so far. This might get Elaine interested because I'll start talking about a paper of hers. <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's the prefix sum of the gradients. Each update can be written as a prefix sum of gradients. So, what I need essentially, if I want to implement SGD, I really want to maintain uh, with privacy the prefix some of the gradients of what I've seen so far. That's all it boils down to. So, just to make it things formal, the follow the regularized leader has been there in the learning literature from 2010 by uh, McMahon et al., then Ducci, McMahon, then Ducci et al., and Lin Jiao, uh, roughly at the same time frame. What this says is that uh, AGD is directly equivalent to this particular update, FTRL update, which is where you take the sum of the gradients, prefix sum of the gradients, take the inner product with the model and uh, have a regularizer and minimize it. It is not hard to see that these two are equivalent, just take the derivative of the, the second one and you will get the basically the AGD update. So the point is that what it really matters is not the individual gradients, but for privacy, it really matters what is the prefix sum of the gradients. And you want to compute this prefix sum of the gradients with differential privacy at every time step. Okay, so this is just a zero. Okay, so now comes the great. So, yeah, as I told you, we want to uh, protect the prefix sum of the gradients. And as I told you, to privatize FTRL algorithm, all we need to compute is the prefix sum with differential privacy. So that is boiled down to right? a learning task has been boiled down to like you are given a sequence of vectors adaptively chosen 
because in these are like uh, your next gradient depends on the previous model and you want to protect the privacy cost of like computing the prefix sum of the gradients over time so uh, let's uh, let's start with uh, uh, one of solution one thing i can do to protect it i can add iid noise to each of the gradients or each of the vectors right add signal noise to this 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 would make it differentially private because I'm protecting each of the individual gradients. If I don't use amplification just to give the scale, so DPSGD on such an algorithm where I just add noise to each of the individual gradients will have a, a utility of something like square root of n over epsilon. Total add noise added to the final sum. If I look at the final sum, the noise added. But if I use amplification, which DPAG does, this number comes down to by a factor of square root of n. Mm -hmm. And you can compute that just based on the fact that how much amplification you are getting and how many times you are outputting. Like you are outputting like n of them. So by composition, you uh, this is from basically from the basic sort of principle. Okay. So the point is that here I'm again highlighting amplification does help if I start using this algorithm, but we don't have amplification. We don't want to use amplification. <laughs> so here comes the uh, algorithm, the main idea of the problem. So you are given strippingly adaptively chosen data vectors G1 till Gn, and all you really need to output is the prefix sum, which for simplicity I will write is as a matrix vector multiplication. You have a lower triangular matrix, I'm multiplying with this vector. And that is my prefix sum. This should be. And I want to output each row of this vector. So, so the problem setup is you want to factorize A equals to B times C such that when you add noise to C times G, because that's the only thing that touches the data, if you add noise C times to G, that should satisfy differential privacy. I'm writing GCDP simply because like that's the privacy you need to which I will operate, but it should protect differential privacy, right? Okay. And this should be differentially private even when G is chosen adaptively. Okay. And uh, what I really want, just this, this calculation should be obvious. What I do is like I add C times noise to C times G, and really I really care about the error, additional error that is coming due to noise. That is essentially, and in the L2 norm, because in getting this typically L2 norm is the most important thing for us to theory. The, what I really want to minimize is B times noise, right? So I'm, I'm, I'm adding noise to C times G, but I'm minimizing the error in terms of the B, right? And now for, now for privacy purposes, notice that whatever C I choose, a single data record will control one of the columns of C, right? So in some sense, the norm of that column, the column norm of C has to be bounded. That is one of the constraints. The other constraint is I have to minimize B times the noise. So, uh, of course, given this kind of a setup, we can start minimizing it, excepting we don't know about the structure of B and C, right? So A is lower triangular, meaning that there is a causality, right? The next iteration depends on the previous iteration, but the next iteration does not something depend on the future, right? Now, suppose I factorize, if I get a factorization of A equal to B times C, where C is a completely square matrix, then can it be even implemented in the adaptive way? I mean, in the streaming way, because now suddenly my C times G, even the first row of the output depends on the last entry, right? So it is unclear it is differentially private or not. What we show, this is a, this is a non-trivial theorem, it shows that if the noise is Gaussian, the noise has to be Gaussian. Then in the continuous release model that I'm outputting sequential release model, any ZCDP algorithm, which is non-adaptively private, meaning that if I give you the sequence of vector G1 till Gn, and for such a vector, if C times G plus noise is differentially private, then that algorithm is differentially private adaptively too. Actually, I'm, I'm confused. So, if you just directly run this, um, the, the prefix sum, like the binary tree based mechanism, what's the drawback of that mechanism? I'm going to the next slide. So, I'll give, oh. so I started with matrix matrix, I started with much more general object. So, I will go to the binary tree also. Okay. One of the instantiation is the binary tree. Uh -huh. Yeah. So, so but there's some advantage of this kind yes. of Yes. Yes. Yeah. So, I'll go there. Like, okay. uh, yeah. 
So uh, I wonder, do you, do you need to predict stump? Because like in the learning stuff, I, I remember you only need a stump, like sum of everything. So do you need a partial predict stump? No, at every time step, like whatever you are outputting, I mean, it, at time t equal to output something, and that depends on the gradients what you have seen so far. So, and the only way this first order methods work is that you take the sum of the gradients. Also, t is not a fixed number, so it's growing from, from one to one. one, to one. one. Yeah. Right. yeah. So uh, perfect. So Elian has a valid point. Why why am I going to this level of generalization? And that's what I will go. Okay. So first candidate factorization. This is uh, DNPR two thousand ten and uh, ten Tom and she or the other one. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So this is a particular instantiation of the prefix sum, uh, and we can compute the error that is getting introduced at least theoretically. This is one way. Uh, there is another way of doing the same thing. You can take the B and C to be Fourier matrices with the scaling of the Fourier transform of the step function. That is another factorization. Just to say that there are different variants of factorization. And the advantage of uh, this kind of an object is that the L2 squared error is slightly lower theoretically also. Than the binary tree. Is it, is it lower and because you are using normal noise? That would it work? Like if you. Uh, no, it is not. Because, I mean, in both fine. cases, in, in binary tree and here also, it is normalized. The fact that I'm looking at L2 error rather than the L infinity error. You are looking at what error? L2 error. Oh, L2 okay. error like this. Okay. Yeah, so it, it's, it's the, the difference theoretically is not that high. It's like logarithmic difference, but empirically, you will see a huge difference. Okay, so this is one of the uh, factorizations. The advantage of this kind of a factorization is that like the tree aggregation, it, if it was not clear, it is uh, this this object is like super fast to compute. Mm -hmm. I mean, even you can try to do it with hand, but if you don't, uh, this is a particular type of a wavelet transform. It's called hard wavelet, and this wavelet transform is like super fast to compute. Fourier transform, we also know is hard, fast to compute. So this algorithm is also fast to compute. Right? Now, really, suppose I don't, uh, I throw away computation out of the picture right now. And let's say I want to actually optimize for the error subject to the constraint, the sensitivity constraint, and other things. So that would, uh, lack of time, I'll not get into details, but that would boil down to uh, a minimization, a trace, now, a trace minimization problem over this X. Okay. And I can run an optimization procedure, custom optimization procedure to actually optimize for X. <laughs> And that would give me B and C. And this is optimizing directly on the error. So if I do this optimization correctly, it can be no worse than the previous two algorithms. But I do lose the fact of the structure of the matrices, which may uh, result in higher computation costs. Let's, let's ignore that one. Okay. This brings to the picture. Uh, uh, the Honecker, all, uh, so there are versions of prefix sum algorithms which I'm not going to deal. One is called Honecker Online, one is called Honecker Full. And the, the yellow line, the orange line is the optimal prefix sum. And you see that that error is like significantly lower. And if you just, the, the vanilla tree aggregation, if you take, it will have these uh, jumps and the structure is like, it's a dyadic algorithm. So at dyadic points, it does different things. And you will see that the, the jump of the errors are also correlated to those points. Whereas if I do the optimal factorization, it's just less, less flat. But that OPT scheme, it requires the uh, very weird optimization process, and does it have the streaming proposition? Uh, I don't care, right? So that's the that's the thing which we uh, the theory that that was the theorem. The theorem said that like anything that is can be computed in the batch setting if it is differentially private, non-adaptively, it is also adaptively differentially private. I'll just add the noise as I go along. Okay. Right. So, so the optimal solution is not that for a transform it is to get some other. No, it is it is completely like uh, gotten by optimization process. But you are saying that the for your up transform that makes it already better, but if you do optimization, you have it will get even better. better. Yeah. And is that an asymptotical improvement over the Fourier transform? I doubt. It's not. Yeah, so it's purely competition. So the I see. So the Fourier transform is asymptotically already. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. And, and that's not our result. So that's a that's a result from like 2018 or something. Uh, 
and like lock factor. I'm not even sure that the gap is like that significant, like theoretically. So uh -huh. yeah. like, I guess a lock factor can matter a lot in practice because what key can be the... Yeah, but these bounds are also like very pessimistic bounds. So you can't even rely on those bounds. Like mm -hmm. it's the lock factor in the upper bound, right? Both the upper bounds are too loose. But you don't have to parameterize for parameters. No, I don't parameterize according to the utility, right? I parameterize according to the test accuracy. Oh, yeah. okay. Okay. So, uh, so I'm getting low on time. So, uh, so essentially, instead of uh, so, the only difference I did here is like you do exactly the same thing. The first difference is that you take next batch of devices, whatever comes, just process that. Forget about sampling and all this business. And secondly, you you instead of adding Gaussian noise, you just fit this DP matrix factorization mechanism onto it. Okay, and the rest of the part roughly remains the same. Okay. So whatever I told you is a mix of three papers, one FLT in ICM 2021, one FLT in New York 2022, and uh, one is in the process somewhere. Uh, the paper is on archive, so yeah. Is this deployed by Google? That's the part. Oh, cool. Yeah. That's the part we wanted to get to, yes. You're going to talk about it? Or? Yeah, there's okay. a bullet tree. Yeah. And in this part, I will only say what I can say. Nothing beyond that. <laughs> okay. Uh, production deployment at the, on the board. Okay. So the one which he implemented, or the person which I'm talking about right now, is the DPF table with binary tree matrix factorization. Because of partly because of chronological reasons, we learned about the matrix factorization story. Uh, I mean, after we deployed it, I discovered some new things, but it was based on the binary tree mechanism uh, of well, in your work and uh, DNPR with some optimizations by Honecker, James Honecker. Oh, that's so cool. I didn't know that it was designed. In fact, my algorithm is using that. Yeah. <laughs> now that you can say So we use DPFTL to train a 1.3 billion parameter RNN LSTM mo uh, language model. Uh, it was used for next word prediction for Spanish uh, Gboard users. I should have written European Spanish. Uh, the training ran for 2K rounds over six days, 6.K devices per day. Uh, per round. So this is the part you see that like if, if I remove this, if I reduce this quantity from 6.k to something else, then my uh, number of requirement, uh, the training time increases, or if I keep the training time same, the number of required devices per round increases. So there's a trade-off. So sampling creates a huge pain. And we configured each device to participate in training at most once in 24 hours, just to make sure that there is sufficient separation between participation, which is required for our privacy computation. And the privacy accounting was done for a multiple DPFT algorithm with mean separation. Like I'm saying, like the algorithm can a particular person can participate multiple times, but the number of times a particular person participate within 24 hours is bounded to one. And that is sufficient to get a privacy guarantee. And trust me, this was humongous pain to actually do the privacy accounting. It is a fairly complicated dynamic program we have to write to kind of get the privacy accounting because of the weird structure of the binary tree. And uh, if you don't trust me, you can, the, everything in this slide is public, including the code. Okay. Uh, here's the main punchline to the RAL2 over knowledge is the first production natural uh, neural net training on user data announced to the formal DP guarantee. Okay. So training satisfies point eight one CCDP for well-behaved clients, because if the client behaves the protocol, for them, we satisfy the property, but obviously for misbehaved clients, you can't do much like I can do weird things. But the point is that misbehaved clients do not have affect the guarantee of the well-behaved clients. So if I'm misbehaving, my privacy guarantee get messed up, but I'm not affecting someone else. The model quality actually improved over the previous implement, uh, previous deployment. Like we not only got a formal privacy guarantee, actually improved on the accuracy. Uh, as I told you, it is incomparable, but for context, US census was using 2.53 VCDP. So the number 0.81 lose it compared to that. But it is in, strictly incomparable. It is an uh, acknowledgement to a bunch of folks from different teams who have worked on it. And as I told you, it is a like, multi year, multi group effort. Now, in the last five minutes, let me give you some evaluation and benchmark tests. Obviously, that whatever I showed you, those are those are the numbers I could tell for Gboard, but for an academic talk, let me give you the uh, uh, 
levels. And this is DPFT level with multi epoch training. So this is what I will actually do the mentis factorization. I'll show you in two minutes. So I am training with multiple epochs over the data. And each user's participation is separated because if I'm training multiple epochs, my first participation only happens after the complete data set has changed. Now, in the matrix factorization, I have to bound the sensitivity with multiple participation, right? Now, one user's participation pattern based on the participation pattern controls the columns of the matrix which I'm controlling it. Now, the sensitivity in, I mean, for this matrix C is the max over all participation patterns, a max over the user participation, which is plus minus one, del to now of C pi. So this is the sensitivity bound. Not hard to compute, I'm going to compute. So now, uh, this is one dimension. If we extend to D dimension, it becomes a non-trivially challenging problem. And uh, under various settings, we have, in fact, the, the bound for one dimension does not, I mean, naturally you'd say like if it's D dimension, you'd scale by square root of D or something, it doesn't. So uh, one has to kind of be a bit careful about how you compute it. And uh, the, the, the bounding the sensitivity in D dimension is a non-trivial problem. What does it mean by D dimension? Because you're, you know, your participation right now, U is a single dimensional vector, right? I'm participating a bit, but in reality, you participate in gradient vectors. Participate gradient vectors, right? It's a vector. So does the sensitivity bound in one dimension when the participation is one dimension, does it extend to D dimensions? Immediately, answer is no. It'll do something non trivial to get that bound. What do you want to participate in the factor? So, u is what? I'm participating plus minus one, right? Uh, Every person is participating plus minus one. So, if I participate in one, otherwise, mine is one. I don't understand. Okay. So, I am participating k times. Uh -huh. I'm as an user participating k times. And my contribution each of the time is bounded by one. Let's say. Uh -huh. right. This is the bound on the sensitivity if such a participation is done. Mm -hmm. right. Now I am saying instead of participating, uh, instead of every time I participate, instead of submitting one number, I'm submitting a vector. Oh, you are submitting a <laughs> vector, which is traditional in gradient descent, right? I'm, my participation is not a. Uh, Number is a vector, and extending the sensitivity from one dimension to two dimension is not trivial. No, sorry. So does that mean you're claiming you can do better than square root of t times one dimension or worse? Uh, it's actually slightly worse. Why is it worse? That uh, it is just it, uh, so another thing. So if you actually write it down, we can find it a counter. The counter example is like a slightly harder. Okay. This statement is almost true. Up to log factor, you can give a probabilistic argument which will tell that this statement is true, but not exactly. I see. In fact, we, for a fair amount of time, we thought the theorem statement was true, like the national exchange rate to D dimension. So, by D, D dimensional participation, do you mean like each user is submitting a D dimensional vector? Uh, yeah. Sensor or? D dimensional vector and submitting K times. Based on Sorry, sir. So, uh, where do these different dimensions interact? Like, why can't I treat each dimension separately? Uh, oh, I guess that's worse. Sorry. That, yeah, that's, that, that's the part. Uh, yeah, it's an inner, in a, inner product, right? Sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah. I see. yeah these are not, <laughs> but this statement is almost true. You can give a very nice probabilistic argument to say that this statement is true. Yeah. Okay. And this two, two norm becomes a Frobenius norm then. Okay, good. So now for the empirical evaluation, uh, uh, I will use a term called stamping, which is nothing but a fancy way of telling that after every n steps, I will restart the algorithm. So and I will do the factorization only for those n steps. And since I can restart, I can do the composition to account for this chart. Okay. So, so now if we see these three plots, let's part, uh, let's make it, uh, uh, let, let's pass it for you. The red line is when I am running the algorithm with no restarts. FFT is run with five restarts. And this five number is chosen optimizing over the best accuracy. Like if you do more number of restarts, then accuracy goes down. If you number less number of restarts, accuracy goes down. So the number five is like optimal for FFT. For each of the techniques, the number of restarts are optimal. Honecker, uh, we ran with 10 restarts. That was optimal for that. DPAGD with amplification is there. So do you see the DPAGD amplification? The best algorithm, the matrix factorization one, 
actually crosses DPHDD with amplification in around like 2.2. We have newer results where we have improved this number even further. Notice that DPHDD's amplification is not a streaming algorithm. I'm giving a streaming algorithm where the accuracy is comparable to uh, DPHDD. What did you just run the binary tree? What did you write Yeah, so that is the green one. The green is the better version of binary tree. I see. So that's what I call Honecker. Oh, okay. And that also crosses DPAGD like eight or ten, but like this one pushes it significantly lower. Okay. And just to give a state where we were, I mean, I'm talking about stack overflow because this was the benchmark data set uh, we use for this kind of next prediction, just to show how the improvement has happened over years. So, so now we are within like we have closed like 94% of the gap between non-private and private training. Okay. And uh, and remember the, the last thing that like DPAGD requires 340 times uh, computation. The fact is because you are sampling from the whole data set, from the sampling from the whole data set. So you have to interact with the whole data set. So if you look at that computation, this is like much cheaper. Okay. And that kind of brings me to the end of the talk. There are some concluding remarks. It is the first production deployment of DP learning with probable user level DP guarantees. Uh, Matrix factorization in DPFTL can completely avoid privacy and we can still outperform DPAGD in certain regimes. Uh, one theoretical question is, is DPFTL sufficient to obtain uh, optimal population risk for convex, convex losses? That's what uh, I guess Karan and I have been actively working and thinking of. The theoretical and other empirical question is like the, the matrix factorization algorithm. The problem is that I have to generate this matrix, like the optimal matrix. Can I generate this matrix in a streaming way? For example, uh, the, uh, the algorithm which Elen has, the tree aggregation, I can build the tree over time. I don't need to kind of store that tree matrix, but in this case, I have to store that tree matrix. Even for the FFT1, uh, I mean, I can do the FFT computation fast enough, but for this thing, uh, this kind of complete optimal factorization, is there a way of like generating this matrix in a streaming way? And that I will end the talk with this picture. And I don't want to talk about this picture after mm -hmm. the uh, talk is over. If you are interested, I can extend this picture. Okay. Yeah. Questions. So, so regarding this, so the matrix factorization was it did computationally more expensive than the yes. one. But it is like uh, it's the uh, pre-computation is expensive. Huh? It, it is computationally expensive. I, I see. So I, I guess maybe an interesting question is whether you can still have like I guess the binary to have polylog um, overhead. Exactly. Each, uh, yeah. So this one, this one is like between those two, like linear linear. Linear. Because like this is a dense matrix, right? In you know binary tree, it's a very sparse matrix we're dealing with. And that was my last question, right? Can we efficiently, in a possibly streaming way, generate these matrices? So for, uh, that's it for FFT. <laughs> I mean, FFT is like a very nice matrix, but is there any way you can do that in a streaming way? No. Even that is. No, FFT, we know that fundamentally we cannot compute in a streaming oh, way. Oh, really? It is because of Heisenberg's uncertainty, right? Oh. If you are sparse in the time domain, you have to be dense in the frequency domain. So that's why you use the word wavelet. For your case, the binary tree is the hard wavelet. Wavelet has this property to sparse in both time and frequency.